Detroit, baby. We out here. You see what's going on. We activated. We ain't playing no games. Yes, sir, man. This uh, this GX from the Forum Magazine, man. And today, we got the honor and pleasure, man, to sit down with somebody that's going crazy with the movies right now. We're just going to start with what he's doing right now because we know that the history you precedes itself. You know what I mean? Everybody know who Street Lord Rook is if you're from the city. Um, you know, but like I said, lately, man, he's been going crazy with these movies. And um, we're gonna get it, we're gonna get into everything, man, today. So without further ado, man, Street Lord Rook, Rook, how you doing, brother? You all right? I'm doing great, brother. Yes, sir, yes, sir, man. It's a pleasure and honor to have you, bro. Pleasure and honor to be here with you, man. Appreciate you for having me. Yes, sir, yes, sir, man. So Lately, man, it's been the movies. Um, you know, just to just to start off with uh some of the recent movies that you've done. Um, it started with the Cheddar Boys movie. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, that dropped this year. Yeah. And then we uh we did the Off the Porch, which yeah. was a which was another classic. Yeah. Came five minutes. Yeah, we've been working. <laughs> and then popped out with this recent one, man, with Skiller Baby, man, going crazy right now outside. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, man, just talk about the work, the work ethic this year, bro. What's going on, man? To be honest, man, it's been it's been a plethora of things done this year, but some of the stuff was done last year. You know, we kind of just been planting the seeds, and now the world is seeing the fruitation of our hard work. Absolutely. So we've been planting the seeds like Cheddar Boys was did a year or so ago, but a couple years ago actually, but yeah. throughout the process things happened where it took a little longer to reach the streaming platform. So it's just been work, man. You know, we got some more stuff on the way too though. Most like, definitely for sure. We, um, if you can, man, um I, I, I kinda wanna what I notice different about your movies is that they real. And when I say that they real, I'm talking about even from the standpoint of having like uh, the Instagram beefs, you know, some of the different things that the young, you know what I mean? The young yeah, people what's going do. On yeah, like how today. beefs escalate in today's time. If you could just talk about your thought process and putting together some of these projects and what's the key that you use to make these projects super relatable to the times? Um, I personally don't want to take all the credit. It's a team effort. You know what I'm saying? On every Cheddar Boy film, it's been a cinematographer named Jeffrey Brown that's worked on most of them. It was a, another cinematographer who worked on Outside named Thomas. And then the writer who's worked on most of all of the Cheddar Boy films is Ronnie Kirk. He's directed some. I've directed some. But it's a team effort. It's a collective effort. But I think we're able to tap into the hood and bring the real because we're from the hood. Uh -huh. We've really been in the streets. We're here. We have an inside aspect to be able to portray to the public rather than just a cinematic Hollywood aspect. So we're able to give a little more in depth of how it really goes, what's really going on, what's real. And that's how we've been able to build our brand and create films that people think are real. I've kind of been doing films a long time. Like I did a film. I don't know if you know, familiar with the film One More Flip. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah I did One More yeah. Flip before Cheddar Boys, yeah, and uh, yeah, it starred Mina Monroe. It got Royce the Fire Nine. Yeah. It got Sada Baby. I think that film probably put the public on notice yeah. now. But prior to that, I had did a film called Envy with uh, Ray J, Lisa Ray, Chico the Bars, the rapper A Z. Wow. So I've been doing this. For quite some time, um, you know, just hard work. You no, know, I believe you get out what you put in. You know, that's what I kind of teach my kids. Like, ain't no such thing as shortcuts. So, sure. right now we just we just grinding. Like, it's so much more to come. Like, I think I have a decent body of work right now, but I got so much more that I'm doing and putting together. I think people will be happy with us long term because. I'm not trying to just be considered a Detroit filmmaker or just a yeah. filmmaker. I want to build something big like Walt Disney. So when it's all said and done, I want to build something great. Yeah. 
Real you know what I'm saying? So that's where that's where I'm at with it. No doubt, no doubt. Um, and, and definitely on that way, the quality is a one. So I, I mean, I see that for sure off of rip. Oh, um, yeah. you said you had Ray J and uh, um, A Z. Talk about the process and getting some of these names or just some of these people just to you know um, get on board with your films. When we did the project years ago with Ray J, it was a guy by the name of M. L. Davis. He was the casting director on that project, so he he casted Ray J. Originally, I was gonna be the star of the movie, right. me and my cousin. And then at the time I was hustling, so it was like uh, I don't really got time for this. For sure. Acting is a lot, a lot harder job than people think. Mm. Just watching it on the couch, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, it's a lot of time where people don't think an actor is good or the actor is not doing what they think, or it's easy when when this lights, camera, the action. It's a lot harder than people think, Indeed. and a lot of people get cold feet. And it's easy to judge actors sitting on the couch rather than actually being in the game. Well, yeah, know. than being in there, you know. So uh, I think people need to take um, a look at that more than judge some of these actors that they see, and they might say, "Oh, this acting was bad," not knowing if the acting was bad or maybe that was what the director wanted. So you know, absolutely, absolutely. Well, we know that you. Like we say, man, you you doing your thing with the movies and, and building uh the Cheddar Boy films to 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 the point where you say at, at some point it's definitely gonna be in the names of the Disneys and et cetera it's like that. Um, but for those who don't know, we wanna take a couple steps back, man, and just kinda go into them them early journeys to you know, to that made you who you are today. Um so Street Lord Rook, man, West Side of Detroit. P Rock to be exact, um, you know. How you know that? The, oh man, I'm gonna do my history, brother. I got to man. It's yeah, my that's, God. that's that's dope. So, like a lot of people don't know that. You know, I grew up on. Yes, sir. I grew up on Plymouth, yeah, for sure. P Rock, don't worry about what we got. <laughs> Straight up. What's up, brother? Yeah, all right. What's up, good brother? It's a pleasure to see you, man. Yes, sir. So, Devon, I don't know if you know the brother. Um, I know that gentleman yes, very well. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> he may, um, definitely appreciate him and his journalism helping the platform and stuff. So we're yeah, just working yeah. together to, you know what yeah. I mean? No, so it's dope to have a great guy like him on your team. Yes, it's sir. a great guy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, yeah, man, P-Rock, man. You know, like you say, don't worry about what we cop, man. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, know, that's that's my hood, man. Yes, like, sir. Uh, if you can, man, talk about them, them early beginnings, man, and, and, and P-Rock. Man, shit, I went to Man, I went to Lessinger. Uh, I graduated from Cody, so, you know, that's my hood. Oh, you know, yeah. I, I grew up on Pullman for Evergreen, you know, so. Straight up. That's my hood for real. Like, you don't be hearing me rep no other hoods, like. I feel like I'm from all over, but that's my hood where I grew up at. Mm -hmm. Some of your early uh like like memories. Um, we know probably like five years old is certain things that we can't remember. When we start moving into them tens and, and going into the fifteen years old and stuff like that, um, what was the climate of P Rock? Was it uh, you know, was it family oriented? Was it was it, you know, rough or you know, um, just elaborate. I grew up in like Plymouth Square. It was like a a Section Eight government subsidized housing, so it was called Plymouth Square. So everybody back there was kind of like family, you know. I still mm -hmm. rock with a lot of those people today. We we grew up so close knit in like the projects where we all was cool. We all cousins, even though we don't talk every day. The love is still there, so it was all love in my, in my hood. Most definitely, most definitely. Um. At what at what point did you? Because I also did my research and know that you come from a a, a heavy family. You know what I mean. Um, <laughs> and it, it, it kind of seemed like the streets may have been like second nature to you because you were kind of groomed in them. Um, what's your if you can like what like what was your thoughts on knowing that your you know your pops and your your mom was in the game. And, 
You know what I mean? Like, what was that whole thing like? Um, I mean, you just learn a lot of things at a very young age, you know. Like, I've learned probably about, like, not talking to the police at such a young age. Mm. Um, things that today I probably won't think is cool to teach my kids because I'm just not trying to keep cultivating street culture, you know. Uh, I think each generation should get better and we should evolve. Um, I think my parents did the best they could with what they had, with what they knew. And I think everybody kind of tends to take that route. Like mm -hmm. whatever you know to get money, whether you're a bank robber, you're going to rob banks if that's your hustle. If you're a drug dealer, you're going to deal drugs. If you sell chicken mm -hmm. or cook dinners, you're going to sell cook dinners. That'll be what you resort to. Um, my family was people that was hustlers. I mean, from far back as I can remember on my mom's side, everybody pretty much hustled, sold drugs. On my dad's side, they were a little more different where they were working people like my aunt. She owned McDonald's. She was a worker. Um, his, my dad's brother, he was a, he worked at the post office, you know, so they were, they were working people, but my dad was a, full-fledged drug dealer, you know, he going out the country getting drugs and importing, exporting, and I wind up doing some of the same things. So, you know, some things I think are genetic, genetically passed down that we don't even look into. So yeah. I think teaching kids about genetics and who they're dealing with is more important than the black culture and community has ever tapped into, you know, Man, because... Yeah. I mean, if you break it down all the way to my mental aspect, like if you have a baby with someone whose family got a mental disorder, a bipolar, or a schizophrenia, something real, mental illnesses, and um, you have a child with them, there's a 50-50 chance that your kid can pick up some of those genetics and maybe bipolar or schizophrenia sure. one day. Sure. So. Um, when I was young, you know, I was just breeding based off she looked good, she cute. But yeah. And then you had learn like, damn, this girl or this individual may come from a fucked up family, a fucked up background, and then you'd be dealing with a baby mom or a baby dad that's not equally yoked mm -hmm. like you and your family. Mm -hmm. So, you know what I'm saying? Y'all end up in fucked up situations. Y'all damn near don't like each other and so on and so forth. So I think those are the things we need to pay attention to. You know, and my dad... He he was a drug dealer. He went to the feds two times and did lengthy sentence. Then he wound up being um, addicted to drugs. So he wasn't a prominent figure in my life. I didn't know who he was like, but he ain't give me the game All right. about genetics and women mm -hmm. who I was dealing with. So you know, so my goal is to give. Women and men, kids, everybody the game. Like you got to be mindful of who you dealing with, who you picking and choosing to breed with. No doubt. Because once you breed with them, you don't just inherit that person. You inherit their whole family and their whole Real talk. history that's for a long period of time. And people don't talk about that. Man, that's, that's, man. that's, that's powerful. You Super know what I'm important because that play a big a big factor into why this the actual divide and split happened between you know, husband and wife or boyfriend and girlfriend that ultimately destroy families, you feel me? Because you don't know who you who you with in yeah. the beginning, for real. Yeah, that's what it really boiled down to. Like, we, uh, as young men, we looking to get some pussy, but a lot of times that fox don't be worth the chase, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. you get a lot more than some pussy when you cultivate a, a kid with uh, someone who is not of the caliber that you should be dealing with. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So Absolutely. Absolutely. So I, I heard you uh, say that your, your uh, pops end up uh, uh, beating the feds or your mom beat the feds or something no, like that. Yeah. My mom, my mom went to trial with the feds and she won. Yeah. So, and so the, I'm, the, I'm asking this question because I can only imagine that a young person, how old were you during that time? And what was the mental space that you were in? seeing your mom it may be normal for some for they pops to but to see your mom go through 
go through this street stuff as well. Um, what did it, you know, wh- how what effect did that have on you? I mean, I can say it affected me now that I'm older. You know, looking back, I'm like, damn, your childhood was fucked up. This what you went through wasn't normal. Now that I'm older, but when I was younger, I can't say it affected me. I lived with my grandmother. That was my normal. Gotcha. So when it's normal, you don't think of you're being affected because that's your normal day to day life. Uh, as for my mom being a hustler, every woman in my family was hustlers. So that was my norm. So you just look at it like that's what it is. You, when it's your norm, you don't look at it as, oh, it's something bad or something negative. This is just how you live. Like yeah. growing up when my dad wasn't around or my cousin's dad wasn't around, it was like, nigga, we got grandma. We got right. such and such. You know yeah. what I'm saying? We not. Say, Feeling like we deprived, yeah. you know what I'm saying? We got everything that we ever wanted. Like, Absolutely. Absolutely. we we always live good, so it was never like, oh, we doing bad. Our daddy ain't around, or your, da-, you know, like that wasn't shit we cared about. But what I can say is, all my cousins who didn't have fathers in their lives today are exceptional fathers. Mm. So it might be because our dads wasn't there that we take more pride in being a dad than our dads did. You know what I'm saying? But I've learned to view the world through my eyes because everybody's eyes is different and everybody view is different. My kids gonna view me as I should have did something a certain way or I should have did something different and they don't know my circumstances. They don't know what I'm going through day to day to make the decisions that I'm making. And I don't know that about my parents. You know, I don't know what struggles they were going through. What was so bad in life that caused them to sell drugs or what caused them to turn to abusing drugs? Because at the time, they might have been making the best decisions that they was able to make with the knowledge they had. And I don't know that their grandparents struggles that they were going through to make my kids or my parents rather view it or do it that way. Mm-hmm. So, you know what I'm saying? Like when you look at the world objectively and through a different set of eyes, everybody lens is a little different Absolutely, and it caused decision-making to be a little different. No, so. That's real. That's real, man. So, you know, known nationwide, because in my personal belief, I understand that in Detroit, we all know about the street lords, you know what I mean? But outside of Detroit, the street lords is also uh, known as well. Um, so thinking about just music, what was that point where you was like, man, I really love music. And, you know, I'm just considering, even if it's just playing around, like at what point was that? Was that before street lords or you actually started when y'all came together? As far as my love of music? Yeah. Or, yeah. uh, my love of music started way before Street Lord. Yeah. Like I had a, a love. Like I, I grew up on P Rock. Anybody from Plymouth know Damon Records. I was a frequent visitor of Damon Records. Um, I bought all genres of music. Well, all genres of rap music, like from the Fat Boys to Kid Rock. You know what I'm saying? Most people probably don't even know Kid Rock was rapping. You know what I'm saying? Oh, that's and, uh, no, that's a fun fact. I ain't know that either. Yeah, Kid Rock had a song with Too Short called Yodeling in the Valley way back in the day, you know what I'm saying? So um, my mom put on rap concerts. She put she brought Sir Mix-A-Lot to Detroit, and uh, they performed at the State Theater with uh, Awesome Dre and uh, Prince Vince, you know, so my love for music has been around for a long time, but I like all type of music. Um, one of my favorite rappers growing up, was Isha. You know what I'm saying? People talked about him worshiping the devil, but man, all jokes aside, that was one of my favorite rappers. You know what I'm saying? When he had the red tape, I like the rap that I could relate to yeah. growing up as a young man. Like, I was hustling. I was selling drugs at a young age. So, his sitting down in a crack house earning my pay, you know, I could relate to that. Because yeah. I was in the crack house earning my pay. Whereas, E-40, you know what I'm saying? I, I love E-40. He had a song called Be About Your Paper. You know, 
that's what was relatable to me. So I grew up on the rappers that I could relate to, you know, from Ice T to Too Short. So it's always been about the music that I can relate to. No, for sure. You know, my mom, she blasts Tina Marie. I know probably every Tina Marie record. Yeah. Period. You know what I'm saying? So I'm all type of music, man. I I, I listen to Jamiroquois. Like so mm. people might not even know who that is, but you know, yeah. my love for music is deep. Diverse, yeah. So and it's crazy when you say that you like music that you could relate to because when you think about the street lords, y'all had the ultimate, you know what I mean? Like like reality rap. You got reality rap, but the, the way y'all was putting y'all shit together, it was very depictive, bro. Like, and it's the I believe it's the reason why Detroit rap is what it is today. Um if you can, let's talk about the beginning of the street lords. Let's talk about how y'all came together um to even be this group, this legendary group in Detroit. Man, I could be honest, like my cousin Yacht started. So before the Street Lords that the world know, it was another Street Lord group where it was a guy named Stony Man, Vito the Judge. I don't remember the other guys that was rapping with him. And then later on it became Jesse Street Lord, Jesse James, Blade, Icewood, Old Dog, Me, Juan. That happened later. Like it's a whole nother group of guys. If we did a documentary that could talk about the earlier years before you guys saw us doing it, and then it's a plethora of body of work, in my opinion, that has better songs, street lore songs that didn't make street lore CDs that people probably don't know about. Wow. Where me and Blake got several records together. And, me and O and me and Jesse, where we got a plethora of different records that the world has never heard. Mm. So, but as for the early years and me, man, I remember it was Jesse, O, Belay. The first Street Lure song that made me want to rap was a song called We Foolin' in This Bitch. And uh, that never, like the world probably don't know that record. And, uh, Jesse James had a song called Money and the Power that uh, was like, yeah, you know. Me and Blade did a song called Cheddar Cheddar Baby. I, ain't gonna, I, mean, I swear to God, it's one of my favorite songs. I thought when me and Blade did that, that we was like, going to be like Puff and Mace. You know right, what I'm saying? Sure and the shit was, the, the song called Cheddar Cheddar Baby was bananas. You know what I'm saying? And I think I was still in high school when we did the shit. Like, I might have been a sick. A senior and Blade was he had graduated, and I, that's what a lot of people feel realize, man. Y'all were young doing this, man. Like yeah. for real. So you said y'all about seventeen. I was probably like seventeen. Blade might have been like eighteen, nineteen. But he had a Mazda nine two nine, and you know we wasn't at the time we were hustling, but we went balling. You know, uh, I remember it would be me, Blade, Royce. Royce the Five Nine is dude named Trey Little. We piled up and Blade. He had a Mazda 929. And uh, we go in the studio, Art Force. Like the whole first CD that sound mm, was created by Art Force and a guy named Maul. Yeah. But on the first Street Lord CD, it's predominantly Art Force. Yeah. Like, come roll with a nigga, Cheddar Cheddar Baby. The producer who did the Majority of that work was Art Force. Where did he come into play at? Was just somebody that he was just making dope beats around that time? He was making dope beats, but it was other producers around before him. I remember me and O, we used to go to Linwood and get pick up my man. His name was Cheerio. I can't tell you what happened to Cheerio. I haven't seen Cheerio in 25 years, but he was a producer that was around. Um, man, it's been a long list. It's been a it's been a hell of a street lord journey. Uh, I was actually in the studio yesterday, me and O, where I was recording yesterday. So I, I got a lot of 
solo m- music that's not so released. Still in the, yeah, still like, in the kitchen cooking, huh? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, I, sir. I play, I can, I'll play the freestyle for y'all. Yeah, yeah. At definitely. the end when it's all done for y'all, but yeah. Yes, sir. I still get it in every now and then. Yes, sir. So, boom. So, I, I heard in a recent, I mean, a, a previous interview, um, you know, as you just said, y'all was 17, 18. At what age did the buku money start hitting to where now lifestyle is just different? Like, this shit is just different now. I mean, I was making money in high school, so no, no, sooner, no sooner than I graduated, like, people who know me will be like, man, when dude graduated high school, I was so I dropped vets. Man, you name it, I had it. Rollies, diamonds, money. I mean, I was making so much money, I was hiding money from myself and forgetting it. So forgetting where I put it. So I was supposed to go play college ball and then I went back up to the high school the follow a year, like, man, I think I went to a track meet. And uh, I seen the coach. He's like, "Why you not at school?" And I'm like, "Man, <laughs> yeah, that's over with, you yeah. know." So, yeah. give us that. Give give us like some of them crazy purchases or like some of them crazy moments that put the city on notice that as a as a collective, y'all are to be you know what I mean respected in terms of music. I just think personally, like if you see a person rapping, like I got this. I got that, I got this, I got that. And I'm balling and I'm rich and I'm this and I'm that. And you really can see it. And you know it's real in the hood. It's like, oh, I believe everything they're saying because it's for real. Mm-hmm. Like, I, like, if we all from Detroit and the world know we getting four, five thousand pounds of marijuana. So if I go sell 400 pounds to my man and some other people know it's like oh whatever he said on that rap yeah he could be i got it's you. real because i know my man just caught 400 got from you. me that was 400 that was 500 man got you. so i know he got money it's before instagram and yeah. i i know he rich i know he balling mm-hmm. look at him i seen him blow 30 40 000 up in the area all stars that's they for real when you could see it, you ain't, you could believe it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, no doubt. No doubt. If you see something every day up close and personal, is you think it's achievable, you believe it. So today, I might look at it like, man, I caused a lot of bullshit. Like, I inspired a lot of people to do mm-hmm. some of the wrong shit. Because if you look at it, most people are like, Man, you see Brook and Blade and them, man, them niggas getting hella cheese. Nigga, them niggas getting money. What them niggas want to do? They want to get a truck. They want to get some bowls. They want to do everything that they think we doing to get some motherfucking money. To take it to the next level because they want to live that same life too. I'm cool. So I might have encouraged some people to go on the wrong way. Got some people killed. Got some people on drugs. You know what I'm saying? Because the things that we talked about and bragged about, you know, at at forty five ain't really cool. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I wouldn't want an eighteen year old kid trying to figure out how to get a thousand bows. Because mm-hmm. I know in balling, just think all of the drug dealer crews you could think of, man. It's probably five years of balling, bro. Damn, that's it. When you really, when you really, it's five money. years of really getting money. When you mathematically break it down for all the niggas who was balling for five good years, got 20 years in jail, 10 years in jail. Like mm-hmm. that shit don't mathematically add up. Then go to jail, do five years, 10 years, he come home, got to start all over from square one. Wherever he left the cheese with, don't got no cheese no more. They just spent it up because they don't know how to manage no money because they never had it. Bro, it don't add up. So for me, I could tell a nigga, man, you got a better chance of being a doctor or a damn Instagram influencer and get some cheese Mm -hmm. than that five years of balling. Mm -hmm. Because the five years, of by the time you at your height of your balling, when you going to jail, nigga, it took time to get there. 
You had losses, ups, downs, ups, downs. Girl. You fell off. People ain't know you got back plugged and mm-hmm. boom, bam. And it still wasn't no as good as people think. On the outside looking in, mother like, man, I know them niggas got hella millions, but they don't know about the million dollar loss, the two million dollar loss, the five hundred thousand loss, the four hundred thousand that the homeboy ran off with, or the so called homeboy ran off with, where a nigga might only got two hundred bands to his name. The world think he got four five million, and now he indicted, mm. and he got to worry about his girl, his kids, his grandma, and. How much time he gonna get in his lawyer fees? Oh. Bro, it don't mathematically add up, but in our community, in our culture, we glorify it like it's some hell of a player shit. Nigga, that's some bullshit. Mm-hmm. If somebody tell me, man, I'm gonna give you $2 million, you're gonna have fun for two years, and you're gonna go to jail for 10, and then you'll come back out and got to start all <laughs> over. Like, right. oh, right. man, that shit don't up. sound. That shit don't sound that appealing. Not at all. Like, yeah. shit, I'm going to give you $2 million. Because, man, I'm going to be honest with you. A lot of drug dealers don't be having the cheese like that. But they be at the club, at the bar, and they turning up. And they fucking all the different little pretty girls at the moment. Mm-hmm. But them same pretty girls be fucking all the other niggas who got the next bag when the rotation changed. Because it's damn near like a cycle. We in position now. We getting our run. Our cycle up within that five-year span. Mm-hmm. It's a new crew. Damn. They got a five-year cycle. And then they cycle up, and all they hoes fucking the next nigga cycle, and it go on, and it just keep going. For the last 60 years, it's been going on. We can all think of some people who done got indicted before the street lord indictment, before the BMF. It's, it's probably a new indictment going on right now of some young niggas that I don't really know. But they been getting their head cracked, and whoever they was fucking, them bitches is on the market right now, ready to suck and fuck whoever getting mm-hmm. a couple of dollars. What do, if I can, what do you think is the hardest, like the reason why it's hard to get out the game when you getting a lot of pay? Like once you got it and you really can get out the game, why not just get out the game? Most people is addicted to the fucking hustle. Like I'm gonna be honest with you, I made millions of dollars at a young age, but. This is the coldest analogy. It's going to be probably the most harsh analogy in hustling. Every hustler becomes like a hooker for the money where they're being pimped by the money to go chase more money where they never enjoy the money because they so busy chasing more money. So they the hooker and the money is the pimp. Controlling them to keep going to chase the money that they never get to enjoy. And if you had that conversation with all of the hustlers, most of them ain't enjoy the money. They was too busy trying to get the next flip. Everybody chasing the one more flip. And the one more flip be the flip that get a nigga head cracked. Mm. And it was, was it that concept that played a, a factor into why you even made the one more flip movie? Yeah, because the one more flip movie, I was trying to get an aspect. One more flip is like a a metaphor for everything. It's always going to be the nigga who flip and tell on some niggas. It's always going to be people chasing that one more flip that get them fucked up. That shit going to go on to the end of time, bro. When I'm dead and gone, it's going to be a nigga that's going to flip on somebody and tell on. Somebody close to you, because there's always somebody close to you or in the crew or that you think won't tell, be the person who tell. Mm-hmm. And it's always going to be that flip that gets you fucked up. Huh. The greed, like, that's crazy. at the end of the day. No, that's crazy because it is. I mean, that's a fact. That's an actual factual. Like, it's going to always be that. Um, mm-hmm. If we can, um, so... Because it, this is this important to me to highlight, um, because the people got to know that the reason why you qualified to talk about what you're talking about is the fact that you've been through every stage of it. You feel me? Mm-hmm. Um, so you actually did time. You feel me in the feds for how long? I did four years. 
And the f- people talk about, oh, the feds is sweet. It, nigga, that's just some bullshit. That shit for suckers. Anybody try to act like the feds are sweet or it's cool to go there is a goddamn fool. Nigga, that shit for suckers. I thought when I went to the feds, it was going to be all bosses, millionaires. Nigga, that shit was the United States County Jail. Nigga, it was a bunch of crackheads, dope fiends, full of shit-ass people. Man, that shit is for suckers, bro. Man, what's the biggest lesson that you, that you, you know, learned out of? Going to jail? That t- yeah. The biggest thing I learned, bro, and the most valuable thing that I learned my whole time in jail was like, don't place your expectations on other people. They ain't going to never live up to you. When you feel like somebody, they told me about the word should, and we use it all the time. Like, man, this person should do this because I did that. Or this person should do should anything. The moment you got to put a should in there, there's always going to be room for disappointment because people ain't going to do everything you think they should do. That was like my most valuable lesson. So, Today, I try not to place my expectations on other people because what I'm going to do, everybody else ain't going to do. No, most definitely. Most so. definitely. Um, if we can, let's talk a little bit about this recent film um, the uh, with, with Skiller Baby starring in it. Um, how did y'all even put that? How did y'all put that project together? And uh, what was the inspiration behind it? Um, that was more of a Ronnie Kirk's idea. But Sada and Skiller are, are our friends. So, you know, it was uh, like, man, dang, we should put Skiller in the movie. You know what I'm saying? So we did it. He was with it. And uh, I think he did a great job. You know? Yeah. Uh, I'm proud of Skiller. You know, I'm happy for him. You know what I'm saying? To see his success and see how he's grown from the time that we shot that movie, you know, to see what space he's in, how his career is taking off. He's deserved it. No, he, he's an ind- individual that I couldn't be more proud of because during shooting the movie, I remember we were at the court. We went to play basketball at the court on break. And uh, to see his encouragement of the younger kids to stay in school and be a good person and get good grades, it's probably a side of people – side of Skiller that people don't get to see. But at heart, he's genuinely a good-hearted person, a good person. Damn all that other rap shit that people be saying that's entertainment to me. Mm-hmm. But I, I, at the core, I have nothing but respect for Skiller. He's a great individual. You know? No, no, definitely, man. Salute to everything he's doing. Because even at that time, it, he wasn't even – he wasn't where he is now, so it's just crazy. How yeah, 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 yeah. He, he, honestly – Throughout shooting the movie, you know, he got shot while we were shooting um, outside, you know. So he, he's, he's blessed. He's blessed. Oh, man. Yes, sir. Um, if you can't talk about some of the other people that you, like, really enjoy working with and seeing their growth, because now you got, you know, artists in Detroit that's getting into their, you know, acting bag. And just to kind of see that transition, because you know it's two different fields. Um, so, yeah. Super proud of Mina Monroe. I'm super proud of her. See the work that she's done, what she's going on to do. We work together on one more flip. We got a new film coming out called Real Love. Um, super proud of Tristan. You know, yeah. To see yeah. him go on and do his work on um, big network shows from BMF to the BET thing. You know, I'm proud of Tristan. I'm happy for him. You know, I wish him much success. Um, Jermaine Brown from New Orleans. It's uh, Jamal Ward, uh, Yvette, my man Jay, who worked on Outside. It's Elizabeth Fox. Uh, proud of her, you know. She's going on to do great things. Chris Collins. I mean, it's a whole list. Anybody who worked with me, I have not had a bad experience. You know, I don't have anybody like, oh, I just want to hire them again. You know, everybody's been pleasant. I've worked with. Great talent. So. Who was the one brother? If I'm not mistaken, ain't that the rap battle uh guy that that's in 
the uh, outside. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's easy to block. Out easy there, to block. Know? Yeah, 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 no yeah, doubt. Yeah. No doubt, man. Great, he great. Did a good job, too, man. man. Great brother. Good hearted person. You know, I rock with easy uh, outside of him. Like, I would say he's a friend of mine. Like, I talked to him. We we cool. He's a great guy. You know, I know he got a lot going on. He's been in the public a lot lately. But, no, you know, for sure. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but, you know, he's a dope guy, you know. Um, Respectable guy. I got a number of great things to say about him. And uh, everybody I work with, you know, I'm proud of the actors we've been able to cultivate and help their careers. I'm proud of my team, Ronnie Kirk, Jeff Brown. You know, without without them guys, none of this would be possible. It is not all oh, just me. Those guys deserve tons and tons of flowers because they helped make this thing happen. Oh, most definitely, most definitely. If we can, we all, we want to talk about the state of like Detroit music or whatever uh, as well. Um, j- just just all around, how do you feel about the state uh, of Detroit hip hop right now? Um, I mean, it's good to see people making money, man. You know, like uh, Detroit music is getting a lot of individuals paid today, where they don't got to hustle. So that's the dopest aspect for me, where you see. People were able to make real money and uh, make a living off of it today. That's that's the dopest part because when I was younger, coming up, we were striving to be able to get in position to make these deals and make these things happen that weren't there. So today things have changed. So for other rappers to benefit and thrive in those opportunities, it's great to see those people hard work. If you Coming could, to for. yes, sir. If you could pinpoint one of those things that changed, like clearly from your time in the music business and to today, uh, the internet, streaming, YouTube has changed the culture of music more than anything for for everybody. You know, like I think streaming platforms and YouTube has change and it's like your world your music could be worldwide in a matter of moments with just an upload so i think that's been like the greatest thing that has happened to music the culture the news everything for everything yeah. because if you think about it down there when when i was coming up everything that we use today didn't even exist from twitter instagram youtube iPhone, the things that are the necessities today didn't even ex- exist. And uh, I kind of learned from the movie outside, like, damn, when I was in high school, if I had a fight and beat somebody up or somebody got the best of me, it might have been 30, 40, 100 people max that knew about it. But the psychological effect of a kid getting beat up in high school today, tomorrow the whole world going to know about it. They're going to get memes. They're going to be on world star. The psychological pressure that may have on a young man today is probably 50 times more than I could have ever imagined because I haven't had to deal with that. So, like, those are things that uh, I look at today that, after making the movie outside like damn that I never paid attention to. Like the culture of being a young man today in society with Instagram, like every young man probably feel like me, I gotta get some money, I gotta sell some dope. I can't get no hoes. For real. And then it's probably every young girl got like, I need a thirty inch weave, I need my butt did, my my titties did because they wanna look like motherfucking Instagram. And now I got daughters, so being a dad and being influential in their life is like key because Instagram had the whole world in the land of make believe because everybody believing this is these people's lives. Well, have these motherfuckers faking? They ain't got no money. They be living in one bedroom apartments. They don't be having shit, and that should be all the illusion. But we've come to a time where everybody feel like they got to act like they something more than what they really is yeah. to be accepted. Yeah. Like you, people can't even be themselves. Like 
a regular motherfucker don't. Man, I just like Nikes. Mm -hmm. Somebody gonna have. Nigga, like man, I gotta get some of them a mid range jeans. It's like yeah. some of that shit ugly, but motherfucker, man, that shit cost twenty five hundred. I gotta get a pair. Like at forty five, I couldn't imagine paying no motherfucker twenty five hundred for no motherfucking pair. All right. Like. Pff. Straight up. Yeah, I feel like I'm a cool fly motherfucker. <laughs> yes, like sir. shit, I can't. For sure. I, no matter how much money I'm getting today, I'm not going to buy no twenty five hundred dollar pants. For sure. That I'm gonna wear one time. Is the Detroit culture is if you get money, you can't wear the shit two times. You can't wear no outfit two times. So but I know about that because when I was coming up, the suits and gators was a big thing. I would go down the, the Broadway, spend three G's on the suit, 15. Man, I got on a $5,000 outfit. I'm wearing that bitch once. Nigga, that bitch to the back of the closet. Next event come up. It's, it's a hair show. Cool seeing them got a hair show. Nigga, I'm flying on that bitch to spend me 7000 again just to get dressed up. I can't even wear that shit no more. Right. Hey, that, hey if I mind, that's interesting, bro. Is we the home of, is, is we still the home of the uh, suits and gators? We ain't that no more, is we? I can't really. Like we done moved away from that. I don't think we there no more. I can't really say that because I think guys clean up when they get cleaned up. But I think people are such designer whores where today they going to want to go get some Louis dress shoes. Or they going to want to go get some red bottoms. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Like that time might be them past on Mari Gators. But niggas going to still go try to buy whatever the most expensive talked about designer is today. Like, it's, it's just who we are. Growing up poor and not having shit is dinner. Like, as soon as we get some money, we got to be like, nigga, look at me. I'm getting money. That's what it is. So, Real talk. So Man. whoever popping designer of the time. They get they damn near like the drug dealer. They get a five year run and then it's a new one of them so niggas. It's the same thing. So <laughs> hey, that five year cycle. That's it. Hey man, that's uh, really it. And, and, uh, another thing too, bro. Um, ha have you have you ever had an opportunity to get signed? And if you did, like you know what I mean, in those times, um, would you would you do things differently? Would you take a deal? Um, if you if you could do today, that I mean the street lawyers got signed. They would offer had like a million dollar deal on the table. But at the time, you can't tell a bunch of guys making millions. Go give you a million dollars. What the fuck is that? Um, the movie I did, Envy, had an opportunity for a deal, and I was at the time I was like, man, they gonna give us two million right now. When I get finished, they gonna give me ten, and it just didn't work out. You know what I'm saying? I wound up getting indicted. Shit happened. But today, I don't think there's anything wrong with taking a deal. Like, Even if you got the money, still take the deal. Um, I won't say still take the deal. It has to be a good deal. You know what I'm saying? But sometimes, to me, as a businessman, sometimes a bad deal is a good deal. And I'll say that because the bad deal gets you in the door. But if you ain't in the door, you can't make no motherfucking deals. Mm. But if you get in that door in the bad deal, the bad deal going to eventually end. You're going to get an opportunity to renegotiate. Mm -hmm. So when you renegotiate, what Jay Z say, you make them pay pay you like for what they did to the cold crush. You know what I'm saying? The re like fifty cent deal probably wasn't the best deal he took, but nobody's going to argue about that deal today. Look at what he's done since he's gotten the door. Mm -hmm. So I think artists get caught up on, I don't take no deal. I don't want to sign. I don't want to do this. And it's like, hey, man, get your ass in the door. Because having 100% of nothing is yeah. nothing. For real. And if you gave somebody 75% and it changed your life forever, give them the 75%. Show. I don't know what I'm saying. Like, as a business person, that's just how I look at it. I'd like to feel like I'm a businessman at the end of the day. It's always going to be about what makes business sense. 
Most definitely. What's your favorite rap moguls of today or all time? All time? Man. Moguls. Moguls? Yeah. Barry Gordy has a great body of work. Um, shit, Birdman got a great body of work. I don't think Birdman gets the credit. Sure. He deserves all his musical body of work. Uh, the longevity that he's amassed um, is probably unmatched. I don't know if, if we're going to be able to see someone come do what Birdman has done yeah, in music. But, you know, Barry Gordy had a run. Jermaine Dupri had a run. Uh, there's been a – like E-40's had a phenomenal run to me. Mm -hmm. Um with what he's been able to do from music to going to wine and yeah. all the other things that he's been able to accomplish. Ice Cube has had a phenomenal career. Yeah, uh, um, I don't think he gets enough credit for the work that he's done. Um, but it's, it's several black successful execs. Uh, Al Bell, who did Stacked Records, Got a phenomenal body at work. Uh, you know, what I believe today, you know, it's about ownership, uh, owning the publishing and having catalogs of work that'll pay, pay you for a long time. So catalogs and catalogs and catalogs because those, they never stop paying. You never know. If me and you did a record today and say that record wasn't shit, I mean, that Why? motherfucker ain't never yeah. touched nothing. And then 20 years from now, yeah. the new Drake come <laughs> sample it and make yeah. God's Plan Part 2. So, and it go quadruple platinum. Yeah. I mean, you're going to get paid for the rest of your life. Like so. real estate. Yeah, so, I mean, that's what I'm about better. So. For sure, for sure, man. Well, man, it's definitely been an honor and a pleasure, man. And I personally feel like you you know you a great example of somebody that's you know what i mean been through the mud you feel me and, and rose out of that you feel me to to be an example for you know the youth and the young people that that may be in the game you feel me or maybe transition and trying to get out the game you feel me yeah i mean um, no I hope, I hope i hope they make it you know what i'm saying like so. i feel like the inner city need a lot more mentors you know all type of Absolutely. So. Absolutely, man. You heard it here, man. Apostle of the culture, man. Street Lord Rook, man. Appreciate you, brother. All right, thanks for having me. Yes, sir.